Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English B. And our objective now for the hour is to have some conversation about Mary Shelley's classic novel, Frankenstein. Now, there's any number of places to go in a conversation about this novel. We can obviously work, uh, you know, at level one uh, and, and talk about the summary of the events in the novel and the like. I'm going to work off of the assumption that you're fairly familiar with the events of this novel by virtue of the study of your packet and, of course, the reading of the novel itself, or at least you're beginning to read the novel if you're not completely through it. I want to begin, though, first of all, by asking a couple of it gets dark at night obvious questions, like if you actually open up the novel and you look at the title page, I've had students that say, well, I'll be damned. I never saw that. Well, I'll be I never saw that. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. I never saw that. It's the second, it's the second line of the title that kind of shocks readers the first time they see it. Wait a minute. The actual title of this novel is Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus. Do you see that? Well, let's start there, shall we? Let's go ahead and jot down that title. And let's ask a simple question. Why would Mary Shelley title the novel Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus? Now, the word modern, I kind of get it. I kind of know what that one means. But Prometheus? What's a Prometheus and why should I care? So, see, we're going we're, we're gonna to talk a little bit about that one, right? That's one question we'll address. We'll try to address in this, in this discussion. Number two, this is a novel when it was published was the source of great anxiety in Europe among religious people. Now, this is an interesting question. We'll ask these questions and we'll try to answer them. There were religious people who said you should not read this novel because it will destroy your faith in God and in Christianity. No kidding. There were people who said that about this novel. By the way, these were people sophisticated enough as thinkers to not believe that the novel was true. Okay, so in other words, they were not saying you shouldn't read the novel Frankenstein because dead people come back to life and dead people can't come back to life. No, 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 no. These were way more sophisticated people than that. The argument they were making was not a simpleton argument. It was a pretty sophisticated argument. And these were sophisticated thinkers. And they said about the novel Frankenstein, dangerous. The most dangerous book that you could read was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. We're obviously going to ask the question, why? Like, it's just a story about a guy who brings this body back from the dead and then really bad things happen and that's the end of the... Why would this have anything to do with Christianity, much less a belief in God or in deity? Just to remind, Shelley's lover, whose name she adopts and marries, Percy Shelley, a romantic poet we will study later, had written a very famous essay on atheism. And for that essay, in support of atheism, he already was considered really dangerous person. right? Because we're talking 1800. We're talking about a time in Europe when pretty much everyone claims to be a believer in God. But sophisticated readers of this novel said, this is a very dangerous novel. It suggests dangerous things about a belief in deity or God. This novel will lead you to atheism. Are you ready for this? They said there's no way out of it. They said there's no way out of it. This novel will force you to believe in atheism. Therefore, don't read the novel. What? Again, we'll have to come back and try and answer this question. Why would anyone have a view like that of this novel? This story written by an 18-year-old girl all kinds of interesting questions about where she got her ideas from. We studied the video yesterday for that one, right? Um, she claimed that she, it kind of came to her in a dream that she had when she was doing this really strange get-together in that 
amazing summer, uh, 1816 summer, when you, you have her and her guy, Percy Shelley the poet, and Lord Byron, another crazy poet that we'll talk about, hanging out at Lord Byron's mansion outside Geneva, Switzerland, on this little island that he owned where he had this castle. And all these strange things happen in her mind, and then she puts this story together that we call Frankenstein today. Of course, she called it the modern Prometheus. Why, we'll get to in a moment. Number three. The novel can also be read as attempting to raise very interesting questions about the value and the dangers of innovation. Technology, discovery. And so at the end of our time, maybe we'll ask a question or two about what this novel has to say on that topic. Okay? So, for example, I'll just set you up by having you think about it. You're working late at night. It's always fun in movies when it's late at night. It's a stormy night outside. You're working in your lab, you're doing research. Through some strange accident, you discover a liquid, you put it in a little dropper, you smash a mouse that you have for part of your research, and then you drop one drop of this liquid on the mouse's tongue, bing, it comes back to life again, totally reanimates in every way the mouse it was before. You go, no way. You just so happen to be working on an upper floor where down in the basement, there's a, a, a corner. That's where they put the dead bodies. And you run down there and there's nobody there. And you pull out one of the dead bodies and you put the drop on the tongue of one of the dead bodies and bing, corpse comes back to life immediately. Wakes up, looking right at you. Everything about the corpse from before back to 100% health. Don't get caught up in the nuances of the question. It is a simple question now. What do you do with this power to bring someone back from the dead? You have two options. One, you immediately destroy it and pretend like it never happened. You never speak of it to anyone, and you never go back that way again. Two, you use it, or you save it to use it later. What will you do, and why? And what does this novel have to say about that question? See, we think, we think about this novel as, yeah, this novel has something to say about the question of bringing somebody back from the dead, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It does seem to have something to say about that. Maybe we'll get to that. So we've got three things we're going to try and do in our brief time together. One, we're going to try and answer the question, dude, what's up with this subtitle, The Modern Prometheus? Two, why is it that religious people would deeply, and still today, are deeply concerned about this novel. In fact, I have lectured students who are deeply religious who after our conversation go, mm, I see what you're saying. I see what they were saying. Concerning, concerning. And then three, and finally, dude, what are you gonna do with the what are you gonna do with the technology that could bring someone back from the dead? And more particularly, why will you decide to do what you do with it? Either destroying it or using it. Right. Shall we go to work? So now I've kind of set you up. Some of you are saying, oh, so we're working with this novel, not so much at level one, but really more at level two and three. Yeah, that's right. The third question is obviously a 3D question. What personally would you do with that level of power, that level of technology and power? So we'll ask that question last if we have time. All right, here we go. The modern Prometheus. I think maybe you will recall that I told you there's kind of two ways to think about the history of ideas in Europe. One way is to talk about that school out of Jerusalem, I think I called it maybe for you in an earlier lecture, where we talked about the story of Job. It's from the Bible, and it's a story about a guy who has all kinds of terrible things happen to him, and yet he still says he believes in God. It's a very wealthy man. He loses all his money. He loses all of his family. They die in a terrible accident. And then he gets these terrible sores. He gets like AIDS all over his body. He's got these terrible sores. And we're told that he cuts open the boils and he lets the pus run and he sits outside at the garbage dump and he lets dogs come and lick on him because he needs comfort. He's in so much excruciating pain 
All of this pain is caused, by the way, we are told, at the beginning of the story, to a man who is totally good. He's done nothing wrong. And yet, we're told God allows it to happen. And terrible things happen to this cat. And yet, all through the story, all of the people who say to him, you should just curse God and die, he says, no. I believe in God. I will not allow for bad things to shake my faith. At the end of the story, the Hollywood ending of the book, we're told that he gets all of the things back even better. He gets a new family. I guess that's better. He gets all kinds of more money and stuff like that, and his life is okay at the end of the story. That's the story out of Jerusalem, the story of Job. And for a thousand years of the Dark Ages, that's pretty much the story of all stories, right? When bad stuff happens, everybody thinks about Job. There's a second story. It predates the first story in some ways. On our history of timeline, it predates by simple virtue of the fact this is a Greek story. It's a story about a cat named Prometheus. And Prometheus discovers, whoa, fire, way cool. You can, like, cook your food, and you can, like, fly airplanes into buildings and kill people. Fire is an awesome tool. Right? Both good and bad, we would say. Prometheus says, sweet, I'm going to tell humans about this amazing secret. Fire. King God Zeus says, no, you will not. Prometheus says, excuse me, but I am going to give this knowledge to humans. Again, Zeus says, no, you will not. Are you ready for this? Prometheus does one of these to God. <laughs> oh, yours, I'll do it anyway. And he does. He does. He gives fire to humans so that they can cook their meat and fly airplanes into buildings. And for that, right, Prometheus is punished. His punishment, fascinating. His punishment is crucifixion. He's crucified on a rock out by the ocean. And every day, an eagle will come and eat out his heart. And then in the night, the heart will grow back. And then every day... Terrible, excruciating pain Prometheus is put through. The whole time, chained on a rock, crucified, all he does is screams at Zeus, the F word. I did it. I do it again. I do it a thousand kajillion times again. Oh. To be Promethean means what? What does that even mean then? If you are a Promethean person... What's your adjective? Promethean means what? The don't tell me what to do, right? That's Prometheus. Don't tell me what to do. I'll do whatever I want, right? Notice the difference between the two stories, the story of Job and the story of Prometheus. Can we say it out loud? These are two different types of personality types. Would you agree with that? These two different kinds of persons, Job and Prometheus, reference two different kinds of ways of dealing with, in our story, God, but of course, the bad things that happen, right? Now, Shelley calls this novel Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. And one or two of us go, oh. Jot down in your notes, why would Shelley call the novel Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. Now, of course, if you haven't read the novel and you're kind of familiar with movies and stuff like that, you normally think that Frankenstein is the monster, the beast that's created or brought back to life by Dr. Frankenstein. But if you've read the novel, you know, oh, wait, Frankenstein isn't the monster. Frankenstein is the doctor who creates the monster, right? What is Promethean about what he does? He goes against the laws of nature. He goes against the laws of nature. What do you mean the laws of nature? What's dead should be dead. Right. That is to say, you live, you die, and that's it. It's kind of accepted. That's the way it's supposed to be, right? Unless you believe in some kind of theology where, at the very end of all things, some kind of resurrection occurs. But people who die are not supposed to become undead. Of course, one or two of you will point out in a 3A observation, isn't it fascinating that in 1800, Shelley will write Frankenstein, but in 2014, one of the most popular shows on TV is about zombies. 
and the culture at large is fascinated with zombies. That is to say, the undead. That is to say, those who die but are completely dead. I'm not quite dead, to quote Monty Python, right? Okay? So it's fascinating that this is still a topic, right? Okay? So the modern Prometheus will gesture towards a doctor who will decide to challenge the laws of God and nature. And he is punished for it, isn't he? You bet. There is definitely a punishment that comes for Dr. Frankenstein. We could talk about any number of punishments, couldn't we, right? Notice then my second question. Why is it that religious people were deeply concerned and offended by this novel? And why did they even go so far as to say this novel leads to atheism? Any ideas? That is to say bringing somebody back from the dead. But remember what I said. These are sophisticated people. They do not read this novel as, uh-oh, somebody living brought somebody dead back from the dead. Way wrong answer. No. Of course, religious people have to come to terms with the fact of dead people coming back to life. The most central story, of course, in the book of John in the New Testament is the resurrection of Lazarus, right? And, of course, there are any number of stories in religious texts, not just the Bible, where dead people come back to life. So if you're going to make the argument that the dead people should never come back to life, and you're a religious person, you've got a serious problem in regards to the very religious text that you read and you believe in, right? Because we have lots of stories of dead people coming back from the dead in, for example, the Bible. So religious people... They, they didn't look at the novel as, oh, no, you shouldn't bring people back from the dead. That's what's wrong with this novel. They didn't believe that Shelley was suggesting it was possible. That's not why. They, these are sophisticated people. They don't, you know, they, don't, they don't just read the book and go, oh, yeah, people can be brought back from the dead. Bad book. Or somebody might actually try and be Dr. Frankenstein and bring people back from the dead. No, no, no. They're, this is a far more sophisticated argument than that. But what argument is it then? Why would religious people, I mean, in some ways you could argue, religious people should be happy about this book. Frankenstein does something bad and he has to pay for it. He gets punished. It's like, it's like uh, there's justice in the universe. Let's support the novel. No. Religious people say no. But why? In other words, these people did not critique the novel harshly for a literal reading of the novel. That is to say, bringing people back from the dead, bad. No, 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 no. Not literally. Well, then why would they be upset at this novel then? The notion of creation. But again, go back to my argument, they didn't read the novel in a literal way. They didn't read Shelley as saying, now is the time for us to try to reanimate dead matter and create a living being. No, 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 no. These are sophisticated readers. They're aware. You can't do that. Is a man playing a god figure by doing so? Mm. Now, Mr. Compton has made an interesting observation as he raised that little eyebrow of his. You see, he did that. <laughs> well, let's go to work, shall we? We're now working with this question of the metaphoric or symbolic reading of this novel. Ah, now wait a minute. What is this story fundamentally about? It's fundamentally about a guy who's a doctor. He creates life. What's the name of the monster, by the way? Monster. Never given a name. What do you mean never given a name? Never given a name. Creates the monster, and then what does he do with the monster? Whoa, 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 wait a second. What happens to the monster? What does the monster do? He does get away. And then what? And what kinds of things does the monster do? Good things or bad things? Really bad things. He kills people and stuff like that. This monster. But wait a minute. We have a question. If the creation does bad things, 
Who do you blame? Oh. <laughs> oh, wait. Frankenstein makes the monster. We agree. Frankenstein abandons the monster. Notice initially, if, you finished, if you've actually read the book, you will know. Initially, the monster's not bad. Initially, the monster has this amazing capacity to learn stuff, right? Do you remember what book it is that he starts reading? It is Milton's Paradise Lost. Oh, wait a minute. Now that's interesting. Paradise Lost. Right. The story about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden eating from the forbidden fruit and being thrown out of the Garden of Eden. I remember that story. That's Paradise Lost. Remember? Right. Initially, the monster is a good cat, not a bad cat. He's nice. He wants to, but he's hideous. And when people see him, go away, go away. Who's the one person that shows him great comfort and cordiality, takes good care of him? A blind man. How come? Blind man doesn't know what he looks like, right? And in the process, he gains some love, but the rejection of society ultimately leads the monster to turn evil and do terrible things, like kill Question, do you blame the monster for the terrible things the monster does? Or rather, are you more inclined to say, whoa, 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 this monster didn't ask to be created. This monster was created. You can't blame the creation fault lies with the creator and by definition must now of course the way that a lot of readers got here was to actually have the argument about who do you blame it within the novel it was only the second step to go oh whoa 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 Shelley is playing a nasty game with us here if you are a believer in Christian theology who created humans when humans do bad things, who is then to blame? Oh. Of course, you will agree with me. Humans have a tendency to do bad things. Would you agree? Yeah. Really bad things. Would you agree with me? Yeah. Did humans choose to be created? So when humans do bad things, who are you going to blame? And then quickly, readers said, oh, no, 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 no. we got to blame the monster. The monster is definitely to blame. Frankenstein is not to blame. Wait a minute. The monster's to blame? The monster who did not ask to be created? And the monster who is poorly treated? monster is to blame? Now this is of course the question of divine justice. You will remember the opening lines of Milton's Paradise Lost is he says to justify the ways of God to man. That is to say to explain why it's not God's fault bad things happen in a world where lots of bad things happen. His answer is what? In a word what? Milton says the answer is simply free will. Choice. Humans choose. Adam and Eve chose to eat of the forbidden fruit and therefore bring, as he says in the opening lines of Milton's Paradise Lost, sin into the world. Shelley, writing about 200 years after Milton and Paradise Lost, Shelley will say, let's think of this story one more time. Let's play the Garden of Eden story out one more time. Only this time, we're going to have Frankenstein create a living being and then we're going to watch what happens. The monster does nasties. Who do you blame? Well, of course, Frankenstein's to blame. He's the one that created the monster and then abandoned the monster and all kinds of terrible things happen. In the end, whoa, 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 what happens in the end? 
what happens at the end of the novel to Frankenstein? Right? Who jacks him? The creation has destroyed the creator. You can see why one or two theological readers of this novel would say, whoa, 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 Shelley is playing a very, very dangerous game here. Her lover might have written a direct essay called In Defense of Atheism. That was fairly coming right at you. You could see it. This one is definitely around the other side of the house and through the back door. This one is dangerous because you do not see it coming. When human beings misbehave, do you blame the human beings? Or do you blame, for example, if you know that a kid walks into the Big Mac and blows away 13 people because he didn't get pickles on his burger, but then when they start interviewing about this kid's life, you find out that for the first five years of his life, every morning somebody beat the ever-living snot out of him and then chained him to a bed down in a basement. And finally the kid got away, and that's what he did. You have a tendency to say about a kid like that, yeah, I don't agree with what he did, but honestly, I'm not sure I blame this kid. you got to blame the people who raised the kid. They're the ones that did all the nasty stuff to him. If he had been raised in a family of love, he probably wouldn't have walked in a Big Mac and loaded on a bunch of people. Agreed? And you got to go, yeah, that's probably right. So you can't, I mean, do you blame the kid? If the kid has been raised in a terrible situation, do you blame the monster? If Frankenstein creates the monster and then abandons the monster. A lack of responsibility, Shelley seems to suggest. And therefore, it isn't the, create, the creation's fault. If you're going to blame anybody for the terrible things the monster does, you've got to blame a creator. Whew. Well, blaming a creator or blaming God, that's dangerous business when you're in the field of theology. Would you agree? This is dangerous water that Shelley is having a swim in. And even today, some students will say, well, I guess I hadn't thought about this novel from that perspective. Now I'm going to have to rethink my view about this novel. Let's go to the third point. You are working late at night in your workshop and you discover... Now, don't get hung up on the nuances of my little story here. And you discover a way to bring people back from the dead. There you go, Schmelzer. You got the power to do it. Let's do it. What are you going to do with this power? I, again, there's only two answers. One, you immediately destroy it and pretend like it never happened. Right? Two, you save it or you use it, which is the same thing. Sooner or later, it might get around to being used. I'm interested. Let's do a quick Gallup poll in the room. How many of you say the minute that happens, I'm destroying that technology? That technology going away now. I am never going to use that technology. I got nobody in here that's going to say, how about it? Go ahead, Mr. Compton says he's going to destroy it. Now, why? Why are you going to destroy it? No one should play. There it is, the famous answer, right? No one should play God. What about... If you got a call, you're ready to destroy it. And all of a sudden you got a call on your cell and it says, come quick to the hospital. Your mom was in a terrible accident, head-on collision, and she soon will die. And by the time you show up, they say, 30 seconds ago, she flatlined, she's dead. You have the drops on you. You have the ability to walk in, drop these a drop on her tongue, she's back, 100% back again. Don't get caught up in the nuances of, well, how will she come back if she's mangled, blah, blah, blah. Don't worry about that. You can bring her back to restore her to perfect health. You have the ability to do that, and Compton says... <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> do you love your mom? <laughs> Garza says... Yes, I but then I'll she, destroy it. <laughs> a hardline argument on here will say, no, the rules are the rules. If you believe in God, if you believe in fate, there is a time when a person must die, 
When the person dies, the person is dead. That's the way it is. It's sad. It's tragic. But no way do you use technology to bring your mama back from the dead. Even if I love her deeply. Are you ready for this? The argument goes, because I love her so deeply, I will not bring her back. It was her time to go. That was the end of it. But I asked this question. What if Compton shows up at the hospital and she isn't dead? But they say to her, they say to him, she soon will be. Unless we do this thingy. We put those two paddles together and ba-boom. On her chest. And then she'll come back. 15 seconds before she flatlines. Ba-boom. We can save her. She hasn't died yet. But if we don't use this technology, which by the way was not around 100 years ago. Do you agree with me? You don't use this technology, she is dead. Agreed? 15 seconds done. Flatline. That's the same as any medicine. Of course it is. Now I'm all of a sudden Mr. Compton's making... Whoa, 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 wait. This is interesting. Whether you're dead or whether you're alive, really technology and medicine, by its very definition, is the attempt to try to conquer death. Right? Philosophically, what is the difference between this right here, ba boom, and 15 seconds later her being dead and you using some kind of technology to bring her back? Mr. Winder. So doctors are bad people because they're playing guns. Uh, yep. There it is. Instead of saying doctors, Let's change it to the language that I used at the beginning that you wrote on your paper, technology. That's the phrase we'll use, technology. In what ways does Mary Shelley's novel shed any light on this discussion of the value and the dangers of technology? Fundamentally, what is technology? What is it? It is. It is the attempt to somehow overcome the laws of nature, right? Human beings aren't supposed to fly, but we do it every day. Human beings are supposed to die when they get any number of illnesses, right? Step on a nail, get tetanus. Dude, 100, 150 years ago, you were jacked, right? Not anymore. In fact, it's interesting how routinely medicine staves off death today that just a few years ago, right? So is it a good thing or a bad thing? If you argue there's a time when a person must die, you shouldn't screw with that, well then what about all the technologies that keep people alive? By the way, we should point out, there are devoutly religious people, especially in the United States, who make the argument that once their child gets appendicitis, they're supposed to pray over that child, and if the child comes back, then fine. If the child dies, that's the way it was supposed to be. No use of technologies whatsoever. By the way, the state has stepped in several times and said, oh, no, you don't. That is insanity. That is an insane position to take. We will medicate your child. We'll give them the appendectomy, and he or she will live. The parents have often said, that's a violation of our constitutional right to religious freedom. Our religious freedom says... We believe in God. God determines when someone must die. Someone must die at a young age for, because of appendicitis. So be it. That's the way it is. On this grounds, you never take an aspirin. On this grounds, you never take any medicine that would in any way try to change the course of nature. And yet, these same people struggle with the fact they like to drive a car. Right? They go across bridges that have been built instead of walking or somehow trying to get across the river on their own. Technology is by its very definition the attempt to somehow trump nature, is it not? Good or bad? Our video yesterday brought up the penultimate question, the question of genetic engineering. What would it be like if by the time you get ready to have children, by the way, this is already happening, you and your husband or wife, about to have a child, could go in and you could look at a computer screen and you could pick what you wanted 
in terms of any number of outcomes. You could choose, for example, for the child to not have certain kinds of genetic proclivities to cancers. So, for example, they could say, this child will not have to suffer with leukemia if you allow for us to manipulate chromosomes. We can do that. We've been able to isolate the gene that is the cancer-causing gene for leukemia. Do you want us to do that? And then you could know your child would never have leukemia. You could determine the color of the eyes of your child, the color of your child's hair, the height of your child, whether your child had proclivities to weight gain or not, and on, and on, and on. Whether your son would be an exceptionally strong athlete, you could make those determinations. Would you do it? Uh, Schmelzer says, hey, listen, this is exactly what we do when we raise animals. You take the strongest, correct? You put the strongest together. You do that for what reason? To manipulate or conquer nature. You got it. Of course, you really do it for what? <laughs> right? Yeah, so you can sell a larger bull or a larger horse or whatever, right? Or it's more useful for work or whatever, right? Good idea, bad idea. Um. Mr. Kroger, we have not heard from you. Quite. I know that. <laughs> what does Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, suggest about technologies and the dangers of technologies? Think about it in simplistic terms. You can create the monster, but in the end, what happens? The monster cannot be controlled. How does that work, for example, in the 20th century with the creation of an atomic weapon? Lots and lots of people read Frankenstein during the Cold War and said she was already making the prediction about nuclear weapons. What? <laughs> Namely what? You can create an atomic bomb, but once you do, you, can only control. you can't control the rise of large numbers of weapons on the planet that are nuclear. In what ways do futuristic movies like the Terminator films or the Matrix films suggest technologies are dangerous? What happens when the computer can begin to think for himself or herself? You do realize there is a computer now on the planet that can outplay in chess the strongest chess player on the planet. Once that happens, almost started to appear like that computer program was thinking while it was playing chess. Is that scary or is that exciting? Scary. Scary, Mr. Like, Garza. Have you seen the movie Evil So, Eye? do we go back in time? Do we try to undo all of the technologies? Some of us will say, yeah, you can't do that. You can't go backwards. That's the very essence of the rise of modernity. There is no going back. Well, there you go. An introduction to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. One or two things to think about, at least.